name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Usually when we think about miracles, we think about our Lord intervening and using his divine power to change the usual course of nature. And that's true, that's the kind of textbook definition of a miracle. The finger of God acting in history. The first cause of all things acting directly upon his creation in a sudden and unexpected manner. The transfiguration, the centre of today's gospel, is a different kind of miracle. Here, Jesus allows his disciples to see him as he really is. He gives them a glimpse of the glory that is his. The miracle, in fact, is that Jesus didn't usually go around in this glorified condition, showing his divinity and power and majesty. The miracle is that Jesus ordinarily made his radiance to be clothed in the lowliness of human frailty. So for the disciples, and also for us, the transfiguration is like the sudden moment where the reality of who Jesus is is made unavoidably clear to them. They see him in full technicolor, no longer in black and white. But it's only for a brief flash, a bit like one of those old TVs where you hit the back of it. Suddenly you might get a flash of the correct colors before it went back to the normal fuzzy image. To have been there at that moment with those chosen three, Peter, James and John, it would have been amazing to get that glimpse of Jesus as he truly is, God made man, manifest in the flesh, the splendor of a divine person shining through a consubstantial union with a human bodily nature just like ours. And this is a crucial thing about the transfiguration. The human body was essential to God's plan to reach out and save us. God came to meet us in the flesh. We aren't angels, pure spirits. And if God had appeared just as some kind of ghostly figure, he wouldn't have been able to achieve the friendship he wanted with us. We know this ourselves. Even with like Zoom calls and FaceTime, nothing beats physical nearness. And a real friendship needs that kind of communion. And God, through Jesus, wants that kind of physical closeness with us. And if you think about it, because God chose to take flesh to unite a human bodily nature to himself, this gives tremendous dignity to our bodies. We all know how we, we kind of take pride in if a, if a famous person comes from our, our town or our country or went to our school. Think about this. We should have an amazing joy and, and pride in the fact that, that the Lord of the universe embraced a human body like ours, embraced our lowliness, and that gives our bodies an even higher dignity. But in spite of this great dignity of the human body, there's quite a lot of mistakes about the body uh, in our world today and also through history. It's kind of been the same. And they mainly fall into two extremes. Those who end up worshipping the body and those who end up hating the body. And I want to look at those two mistakes uh, briefly this morning. The first one, which kind of we all know about, is, is when people start worshipping the body and ignoring the soul. People that go down that path exist as if there was nothing, almost like they're just animals, because their life is centred around satisfying basic pleasures or an obsession around bodily aesthetics, above all else. But doing this, just focusing on the body, actually neglects higher human pleasures that are more refined, even like the joy that comes from working hard and getting good results in an exam, or the deep joy of a happy marriage, or, or like the joy of seeing your daughter ride the bike without stabilizers for the first time. And of course, supernatural joys, the joy of having your sins forgiven in confession. If you're just focused on, on the body and just bodily pleasures or bodily appearance, you miss out. You miss out on those 
amazing things about human existence. And also it ends up in the addiction, in despair, in failed relationships and desires forever slipping through your fingers. And ultimately we know it can lead to a separation from God forever. Because this kind of body worship starves the soul and makes it unfit for heaven. So that's the first error of worshipping the body at the expense of the immortal soul that it is united to and which is ignored at peril, both for happiness in this life and in the next. Now the second error is a bit more subtle. Despising the body at the expense of a spirit or an inner feeling. Now you might think that one is a bit weird. Uh, it's not so obvious. If you're a fan of philosophy, you'll know that the ancient Gnostics took this approach, as did some of the followers of Plato. They had this idea that the aim in life was to break free from this shell of the flesh in order to be set free and just gaze upon um, intellectual things. That the body was some kind of unhelpful and evil thing and that the spirit was the only thing that really mattered. But you know, that's also an error because we are a body and soul unity. Our bodies, sure, they often desire things that aren't good for the soul. That's because of original sin. But the body remains something that is part of God's plan. As I said at the beginning, our dignity as human persons is that God has taken a human bodily nature in order to have a full human friendship with us. One that comes through us as body and soul unities, meeting him in the flesh. Our body is the only way our soul has to reveal itself. We can't see each other's souls. We only see the soul through the body. And the body is created to reflect the soul. The two parts are made for each other. They're totally complementary. In a very real sense, if you want to be a soulmate with someone, a close friend, it's only possible by interacting, being near with them physically. And maybe now you're beginning to realise some modern versions of the Gnostic view that the body was something not very good and only the soul mattered. Think about some of the gender theory stuff that would say that it is necessary to mutilate a body or damage it with drugs in order to satisfy some hidden spiritual identity as a person of the opposite sex. Catholics understand, instead, that the body that we've been given truly reflects who we are. It shows forth the soul. The body reveals our inner identity. The body is not simply a chunk of flesh that can be manipulated to suit a kind of spiritual intuition about who we truly are. Because who you truly are runs through every cell of your body. The body which is united to your soul not something alien to it. Of course, we've got to pray for anyone that's kind of struggling in this area, anxious about it. But for Catholic teaching, this means helping the person to come to terms with their body, of working through their wounded perception that needs healing. So that's then the second error concerning the body, a depreciation of the body, seeing it as alien to the soul, rather than the revealing of the soul to the world. Okay, so now a, a final thought on the transfiguration. Because it is a gospel of good news for our bodies. God has taken a human body to himself because our bodies are worth something to him. They are the means by which he wishes to reach out to us. And he wants us to spend eternity with him in risen bodies. The aim of Christianity is not to be a floating soul in heaven. It is that our bodies rise again, their youth, their beauty, their health restored. In fact, everyone's body rises again because the soul is made for the body. And when God raises the dead on the day of resurrection, every soul is reunited to its body. The body will be somehow reconstituted from the earth. And actually the condition of the person's body will reflect the spiritual condition of their soul. 
So the bodies of those who died as God's enemies will be hideous. But for those who died as God's friends in the state of grace, their risen bodies will be glorious. It will still be the same person that walked this earth, but it will be, they will be totally perfected. The transfiguration gives us a glimpse of what our bodies can become like through the power of God's grace. If we rise again with the saints, then we can expect our bodies to have the same kind of beauty and glory and strength and vitality that Jesus had on the Mount of Transfiguration. God wants us to have bodies for eternity so we can share paradise with Jesus who has taken flesh to be physically close to us. In the new heavens and the new earth, we hope to enjoy that physical bodily friendship with Jesus, just like his disciples had with him, and to do so hopefully in the company of so many of our loved ones from this life, also with glorified, perfected bodies. At every Holy Mass, we in fact anticipate this moment. Because in Holy Communion, in, see, in seeing and being with the physical presence of Jesus, Jesus in the host, Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, we are beginning here and now that bodily friendship with Jesus that we hope to enjoy throughout eternity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.